but I told you we were going to talk about the sacral society that was that was pushed and that was set up. As we look at the Donatists and we look at exactly what was done with them and what their big problem with there's two systems there's Constantine's and then there's the, the then there was the Donatists that was what you would call the New Testament the New Testament believers position on on government on civil government and everything and church government the way church government was supposed to be so these two things were a problem they they there was going to be this there came with Constantine there came this this battle that was coming to the forefront and the Donatists, as they stepped out and did what they did, that really showed where the real battle was. Uh, and these two systems would collide. And that's exactly what happened here. So we're going to continue to read in uh, the Reformers and their stepchildren and read about, read about them uh, and, and just exactly what... Uh, the battle was all about there. So, anyway, uh, let's get right into it here. Uh, the New Testament envisions no trouble in the outworking of this division of labor, as long as both sides play in the register intended for them. We talked about that last week in Acts chapter 4, 18. Uh, we'll turn there here real quickly. Acts 4, 18. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So we haven't memorized those verses yet, correct? I don't think we have, have we? Let's do those. Acts chapter or 4, Acts chapter 4, verse, we'll do verses 18 through 20. Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. Because this is really the, the, the argument. This is really, you know, whether civil government has the right to, to push the church and whether church, the church should, should uh, you know, bring themselves into a partnership with the state. And that's the two systems. That's just basically, in a nutshell, those are the two systems that... that um, that we're facing here right now with this. And that's what the Donatists, they stood for that New Testament system. It must not escape the reader that this was a novel insight, so novel as to be revolutionary. The world had never seen the like of it before. For all pre-Christian society is sacral. By the word sacral, which we shall be using frequently and which we request the reader to impress on, on his mind, we mean bound together by a common religious loyalty. See, here's what Augustine wanted. He wanted... The, the community to be bound together by one religious creed. So if you were part of that religious creed, then you were allowed to be in their community. All right, now, now we're going to ask, ask, now it's question time for a second. Where have we heard about that, that, same, that same philosophy in Baptist history in America? Where we learned about that same sacral society they had set up? Massachusetts, that's correct. And who did they oppress? Anyone who, didn't agree. Anyone who didn't agree with them. So we have the Quakers, and who were the Baptists that were oppressed at that time? You know who they are. Who were the Baptists? You remember in New England, right? Kind of familiar? Has it have a name like yours, kind of? <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, John Clark, right, and Obadiah Holmes, and, and, and those men, they were persecuted under what? That desire to have that sacral system. It's a, very, it's a very dangerous system, bound together by a common... You know, there were Quakers that were abused, and I believe hung also, by those that named the name of Christ. What an everlasting shame. To even Let's... Let's just say for a second that those men were saved that put those Quakers to death. Let's just say they were. Could you imagine going to heaven and facing the Lord with that? Could you, could you imagine facing the Lord with that, that, that you, you persecuted these people because they had wrong theology? 
It's really frightening is what it is. By sacral society, we mean society held together by a religion to which all the members of that society are committed. The society of ancient Babylon, for example. So see, here's what we're going to look at today. It's not just modern day um, Rome at that time or the, or the kingdom of Rome um, or anything like that. It's not just that, right? But it is... It is also the, the uh, history of that same society. So it was done in ancient Babylon. It's been done for a long time. The society of ancient Babylon, for example, was a sacral society. All Babylonians were expected to bow to one and the same object. Look at Daniel chapter 3. Let's turn there. Right? See, I, when, I under, when you understand the Bible and you understand the New Testament, you don't like what happened in Daniel chapter 3. You know, even if it was, you know, in that sense, here's a king that then he goes, okay, well, everyone, if you don't follow this, if you don't follow suit, right, in Daniel chapter 3, if you don't do that, then guess what? You're all going to die. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made the image of gold, right? He said, you're going to worship this image of gold. Their society was pre-Christian. The society of Ephesus was sacral. All Ephesians were expected to join in the chant, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Ephesian society was pre-Christian. In our own day, the society of the Navajo in our southwest is sacral. All members of that society are expected to take part in the ritual. Theirs, too, is pre-Christian society. According to this construction of things, the Old Testament, too, was pre-Christian, as indeed it was in the chronological sense. Every member of Old Testament society was considered to be in the same religious category as was every other member of it. This makes Old Testament society sacral and pre-Christian. It was monolithic society rather than a composite one. It had no room for diversity or for or against. If we are permitted to look ahead a bit here, there would, in all probability, never be, have been a second front in the, ref, in the with the Reformers had, if the Reformers had been aware of the pre-Christian quality of the Old Testament in this matter. It was the Reformers' refusal to admit that there is the perspective in the relationship that obtains between the two Testaments. It was their refusal to grant that the one had outmoded the other at this point that caused the exodus of the stepchildren. So what he's saying is later on in the Reformation, the reason why during the Reformation you had that second front where those Anabaptists came out of the forefront and then some of the other reformers broke off from others and all those, the reason why that took place was because they weren't going, the reformers didn't go far enough with what they were doing. And others were willing to. Others were willing to follow the New Testament. It was because the Jews of the day were pre-Christian and therefore sacralist in their conception of things that the problem, whether it is lawful to pay tribute to Caesar, seemed to them to be an insoluble problem. How could a man, they asked, be loyal to the political community by paying his taxes without thereby being disloyal to the religious community, the church? They, the sacralists that they were, knew no answer to the question. It vexed them every time they tangled with it. And for that reason, they confronted the master with it so that he too might be embarrassed by it and be hopelessly pinned in a corner. How great must have been their surprise at the ease at which Jesus, acting on the new insight he had come to convey, sailed through the dilemma with render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. In his way of thinking, there wasn't even any problem. See, Jesus said, his kingdom was not of this world, right? Just like our verses say. If this kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? He's like, my kingdom was not of this world. I know there's no video playing in there. I, I, I oh, did you? Okay, okay. But, you know, so Jesus laid down for them. You know what? Yes, whatever God told you in his word that belonged to Caesar, then you give it to him. But whatever God says is God's, 
don't give it to Caesar. Right? right? Don't give it to him. As the thoughtful reader will have perceived, much is implied in this New Testament innovation. In it is implied that the state is a secular institution, secular in the etymological sense, namely pertaining to this age or era. The state is intended by God himself to regulate as best it can with the insights available to it and the resources of its command, the things of this age. It is implied in the New Testament vision that the state, being itself a creature of God's common grace, works with the resources which that non-redemptive grace makes available. It is implied in the New Testament vision that Christianity is not a culture-creating thing, but rather a culture-influencing one. Whether the gospel is preached, human society becomes composite. Hence, since culture is the name given to the total spiritual heritage of an entire people, there can never be such a thing as a Christian culture. There can only be cultures in which the influence of Christianity is more or less apparent. We believe that. We don't believe in a Christian state. If there was a Christian state, it would be this church. This is a Christian state, right? It has nothing to do with the secular government. It is purely spiritual. But its influence influences the secular world. Right? What we do influences the secular world in that sense. But the two are separate in, in that. Hence the garden enclosed, right? Amen. The New Testament vision does not pit a Christian culture against a non-Christian culture. Rather does, it introduce a le rather does it introduce a leaven into any existing culture into which it insinuates itself, a leaven whereby that already existing culture is then affected. New Testament ideology does not seek to make the non, the not yet believer cultural st culturally sterile, nor even the outright unbeliever, the disbeliever. It is satisfied to add the Christian voice to the culture ensemble. What, what is it saying? We're not trying to we're not trying to build a kingdom of this world. Like that's not what we're doing. We're not hasting on the kingdom in that sense. Do you understand that? Here's where we differ from the reformers. Here's where we differ from what their goal was. Their goal was to take up arms, control the state, and bring on the kingdom of God. And all they're really going to do is bring on the kingdom of Antichrist. That's really what they're going to do. They're setting up this huge monstrosity. And you can see it in the governments of this world. It'll be Christianese is what it'll be. But it won't be what you're sitting in today assembled together as a New Testament church. It will not be that. He said, again, if we are permitted to run ahead of ourselves a bit, we may at this point call attention to the fact that the house of freedom and of democracy has been raised in those areas, and we dare say in them alone, where men have made serious work of the New Testament vision as societal composite, composite compositism, excuse me. What is he saying there? He's saying that the Christ, anywhere where Christian society was, true biblical Christian faith was, it influenced the form of government that was there. So in other words, when you look at Rhode Island, what do you see? You see the government, you see that Christianity influenced the government of Rhode Island, that lively experiment. We see the Constitution. We see the Bill of Rights. Those were influenced by Christianity. Because you don't find a Bill of Rights. You would never find anything like a Bill of Rights in Islam. No. By the way, you would never find a Bill of Rights in Roman Catholicism. Right. You would never find anything remotely close to that. And even the Reformers, because the Reformers didn't want a Bill of Rights no. in a form of government. Right? What did they want? They wanted total control. They wanted a sacral society. That's what they desired to have, was a sacral society. That's what they wanted. It more than any other single factor has given us human society with option built into it. For pre-Christian society is optionless society, just as post-Christian society will again be optionless society. The New Testament's idea of societal com compos compositism is the only real alternative to the solidifying ideologies that have given rise to the modern optionless and optionless totalitarian states. It was the outworking of the sacredless thought, thoughts, habits of Roman society that occasioned the persecution to which the early Christians were exposed. 
The Roman state had its officially designated object of worship, and to it every Roman was expected to give homage. It is significant that the early Christian did not launch a crusade to have the object ousted and a new and better object, the God of the Scriptures, put into its place. See, let's go back to that. The apostles weren't trying to change the Roman Empire right. in that sense. They weren't trying to take over the Roman Empire, have everyone worship Christ instead of worshiping Jupiter or Saturn or, or whoever, right? Or Apollo or whoever. That's not what they were trying to do, right? What were they trying to do? Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They weren't trying to take over a government, take up arms and say, okay, well, you were worshiping the wrong God. So now it's okay by force and by the sword if you worship our God. That's not what they were doing. And that's not what we're here to do either. Remember, Christ said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight? We're, we're not setting up that kingdom. here. By the way, Jesus doesn't need Rome's kingdom. He doesn't need their help. He doesn't need your help in setting up a kingdom here, right? His kingdom, he'll, he'll come and he'll lay down all rule and authority when he comes. We're to occupy till he comes. What does that mean? We're to preach the gospel. We're to start churches. We're to obey the Great Commission. We're to, we're to, we're to be salt and light to society, to this world. We're to be salt and light to this world. That's what we're here for. We're not here to set up any sacral society. It's nonsense. And by the way, they're not influencing society. They're teaching people to hate Christianity. It's really what a lot of them have done. And, they don't, and the people don't even know what they hate because it's not biblical Christianity that they really hate that much in that sense, although they would because they have the spirit of Antichrist in them. In it is implied that the state is a secular, as a thoughtful reader will perceive much in it is implied in the New Testament. Oops, sorry, wrong one. Where did that one? Um, let's see. It must be said here with considerable emphasis. Well, actually, let me back up here a little bit. The primitive church did not propose to remove the object. We talked about that. It was, the con it was content to worship the Christian God in an off-the-street place and to ignore the object that stood in a place where none belongs, being careful that no one would have reason to complain that by so worshiping at an esoteric shrine, the Christians were drawing themselves away from the affairs of Roman life. See, in other words, what's he saying? He's saying basically... Christians weren't plotting the overthrow of the government of Rome. That's not what the apostles were doing. Like, that's not what they were. Like, the apostle Paul started a, a church in Caesar's house. Did he ever tell the, that church to rise up against Caesar? No. Not at all. That wasn't, that wasn't his motive. The motive was the gospel. It must be said here and with considerable emphasis that the New Testament vision of a societal compositive did not lead to any attitude of aloofness from the work from the workaday things. We point this out because the notion is broad that they who take the New Testament seriously at this point must of necessity be nonchalant concerning the affairs of public life. The aloofness which was characteristic of the Middle e medieval and modern sects, an aloofness about which men have often complained and not without cause, was not a feature of the early Christians. Aloof Christianity comes later and then by a way of reaction. No early Christianity was not aloof. It was deeply involved in the affairs of society. The literary product, a literary product, uh, the epistle of Diogenetus, which according to the modern scholarship dates from the near end of the second century, draws a parallel between the souls and the body on the one hand and the Christian and society on the other. So, you know, we're to be very active in society in that sense. We're to be good citizens. We're to pay our bills. We're to, we're to obey the, the, the laws of the land that don't conflict with the scriptures. We're to be the best of citizens. I mean, our testimony is to shine out before all of them. You know, we are to be, in that sense, you know, we're not to be rebellious and, and, and wicked people and, and, and any of that. We're not to suffer as evildoers in the world, in that sense. But if we suffer as Christians, that's fine. That's the will of the Lord. 
One man said it this way back then in the second century. He said, Christians are not distinct from the rest of men in country or language or customs, for neither do they dwell anywhere in special cities or of their own, nor do they use a different language, nor practice a conspicuous manner of life. But dwelling as they do in Hellenic and barbaric cities as each man's lot is and following the customs of the country and dress and food and the rest of life, the manner of conduct which they display is wonderfully confessedly beyond belief. So in other words, they, weren't, they, they, went, they didn't act that much different in the sense of society. You know, they went to the store, they did their grocery shop, and they did their other things that normal people do. They didn't go about the riotous and drunkenness of the times. But see, that's what always makes God's people stand out because they're not a part of that. Right. When you're not a part of doing all those things, yeah, right? Forward. And it's not because it's legislated for you that you can't do it. It's because you follow the Lord and you won't do it. You don't do it because you believe God and you believe his word. And that's why. Early Christianity, may be said, took seriously Jesus' idea about in the world but not of the world. It knew that it was the master's will that they be the salt of the earth, a formula that speaks of deep difference going hand in hand with the close integration. The early Christians knew that they were partakers of the anointing, a transaction whereby they were on the one hand set in contrast with the world about them and on the other hand set in context with it. They knew that one must follow peace, of which the basic meaning is of holiness and togetherness, in which the essential meaning is separation if one is to see God. You know, we practice separation, but that doesn't make us bad citizens. Right. You know, of all the citizens of every time, they really didn't have anything bad to say about the Waldensians, the Lollards, the Donatists, and all those men. Why is that? Because they really couldn't. They didn't do, they, they weren't lawbreakers. They weren't evil men. They, their, their children were good children. Their, their, their families were good families. What didn't they like about them? That they served a different God than they did. They wouldn't bow to the, to the state. All told, early Christianity acted on the insight that Jesus had come to create a people within a people. It is realized that it is by the act of faith that men become the sons of God. With a sonship that is not simply continuous, with the sonship that is by nature, primitive Christianity knew that although God is the Savior of all men, He is the Savior in a special way of them that believe. Amen. Early Christianity's world was peopled with folk who witnessed and folk who were witnessed to. It is therefore conceived of a composite society, not a monolithic one. So it wasn't, you know, like the Mormons, we're going to go start a Christian city. Well, God never told us to go start a Christian city. He told us to go start churches all over the world and preach the gospel, right, and obey the Great Commission. He didn't tell us to start Christian cities. Right? Yeah, kingdom building and city building and nation building. God never told us to do that. That's not what he called us to do. But that's what the reformers did. What is Geneva? That's what it was. Contrast the difference in Geneva, a sacral society, and Rhode Island. Rhode Island was not a sacral society. In fact, Jews and Quakers and all of those were free to come there. They were free to worship God and, 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 and worship the God that they chose to. As long as they didn't harm anybody else, they were free to do that. And that's the way God intended it to be. That's not some Masonic concept, by the way. Amen. It's called not killing people for what they believed. Right? One of the sayings of Jesus that has caused later generations trouble, if not embarrassment, gave the early Christian no trouble at all, namely his dictum. Think not that I am come to send peace upon the earth. I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against the mother. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. To the early church, this was but a statement somewhat hyperbolic, perhaps to the effect that Jesus came to usher in a new concept of society. In it, he was setting forth his concept of the composite society by carrying it even in the family circle. If societal co compositism can and does occur, even on this level, what will it be in the great out of doors? See, Jesus said, you know what? Your families are going to turn against you. I'm gonna, that's going to happen. He was setting up that Christian in, in the sense, his church. 
that it would be at variance with others. And doesn't it cause that today? You don't have the fellowship with your family that you once had because of what? Because of what you believe about the Bible. Because of what you believe about God's Word. You know, this concept was startlingly new. Roman society was sacral and not and non-composite. And its sacralism came to expression everywhere. In the institution known as Idolithia, for instance, the, peop- the placing of the meat supply before the object. This ancient custom had grown to such dimensions that virtually all meat available at the butchers was placed meat and bore the stamp of the object which Romans worshipped. Think about that. It is a curious fact, one certainly not without its significance, that as far as we know, the early Christians did not so much as contemplate the possibility of having the public meat supply stamped with another stamp, the stamp of the Christians. They didn't say, well, we got to have our own meat stamped Christian in order for us to eat it. You know what Christians did? Eh, okay, that's what it is. They didn't go to where they were offering meat to idols or they were strangling things like James talked about. But what didn't they worry about? They didn't worry about the fact that that was stamped. Because I'll tell you what, there ain't nothing more pagan than made in the USA. I can guarantee you that. (laughs) There isn't, right? It's about as pagan as you get, right? So when you think about about that, it's it's the same concept. But the Christian, the early Christians, they weren't trying to build that kingdom and turn society into that. And that's the problem, that if, you're ba- if your doctrine is messed up, you'll believe that that's the duty. You'll believe, that, you'll believe like what David Barton teaches, that America is this Christian nation. And there is no such thing as separation of church and state. And what that says is that my flavor of Christianity is the flavor of the hour, and everybody else is going to be persecuted. Right? Just like the Puritans did in New England when they when they tried to force infant baptism and they tried to they they tried to outlaw any any private worship, right? Same thing. This ancient custom. So anyway, the Bible uh, we we talked about that a little bit. They seem to have proceeded upon the assumption that a religious mark upon a common meat supply is an anomaly anyway, one which a Christian does well simply to ignore. We just, I mean, we're not superstitious. We just ignore it, whatever. Amen. They walk nonchalantly over the matter with an eat anything and everything that they sell in the shambles and never mind the questions. The only moral problem posed by, by that was the question whether it was in keeping with the Christian attitude to walk roughshod over the sensitivities of a weaker brother which we talked about in Acts chapter 15. The man who still heard religious overtones in the butcher shop. (laughs) Right? The Roman society, prompted by its sacralist view of things, oppressed the Christians, especially when Rome was beset with political worries. They ascribed their political troubles to the fact that the religious pattern of uniformity was being shaken. The religion of Rome was a religion of do. I give in order that you may give. And every adversity was interpreted to be a frown of the object for his loss of patronage caused by the Christians. So listen, here's how those sacral systems are very superstitious. Listen, if the Tiber went out of its banks or the Nile failed to do so, the Christians were blamed for this manifest gesture of divine displeasure. And then the cry rang out to the lions with them. So also if the earth moved or the sky stood still. Right, they, they blame the Christians right away. Well, all this evil is coming because Christians won't worship our God. So therefore, we must kill them. Meanwhile, the Christian cause went forward by leaps and bounds. In an incredibly short time, Christianity had insinuated itself into every level of Roman society. All through the empire and beyond it, it had marched triumphantly to the ends of the earth. So much has this remarkable growth been attributed to the effect of the martyrs. So often it had been said that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the church. So we see the sacros pattern, and we see it developing. Now we're going to move forward here. I'm not going to read all of that, but we're going to move forward. Uh, what Tertullian feared came to pass in the age of Constantine. So, so you have, from the time of the apostles, you have Christianity moving along. You have Rome, a sacral society. They had their Roman gods. The Greeks had their gods. They had a sacral society set up. They all worshipped the Roman gods. They all worshipped uh, 
the Greek gods, whatever the case may be, that's who they worship. Christianity, well, we got to kill them. They won't worship our God. Well, then Tertullian said that something was going to come to pass. What Tertullian feared came to pass in the age of Constantine, which was ushered in by the conversion, and he puts this in quotations like I do, of the emperor. Much had been written about this event, and much remains to be written. One thing seems very evident. It is that in the case of Decius before him, the problem to which Constantine sought a solution was political rather than religious. The facts are that Constantine was a worried statesman as well as he might have been. The empire he had inherited was coming apart at the seams. He had his sleepless nights about this fact. How could he conquer his problem? How bind the sprawling domains together again? How regain the ancient stability and inner cohesion? Then came the much celebrated vision, a cross in the clouds, and the words in hoc signo vinces, in this sign conquer. There he had it. Make the religion of Jesus the religion of the empire, and then look to it to achieve the consensus that he, sacralist that he was and remained, felt he had to have. So he had to, he had to change Rome, the object of Rome's worship. Now, do we find that anywhere in the New Testament where, we're, where Jesus said, okay, so if there's a system out there, just change the object of that system to me and follow it? Not at all. But that's what they did. So now you can understand why the Donatists would rise up and they'd be like, no, we're not okay with this, right? We're not okay with this form of government. We wish to say in passing, for he shall return to this matter later, that this was, was to read a new and totally strange meaning into the cross. Is the cross of Christ then a thing whereby emperor's ambitions are realized? A device that sees the political aspirations of a power-hungry ruler through to victory? Surely Constantine had grasped little or nothing of the ideas set forth in the cross of Christ. One need not go to length of the writer who speaks of Constantine as the murderous egoist who possessed the great merit of having conceived of Christianity as a world power and have acted on this novel insight. We can easily imagine the joy of the Christians in having finally obtained a firm guarantee against the persecutions, but we are not obliged to share that elation. But one cannot stomach any longer the hundreds of pages of extravagant praise heaped on Constantinius Magnus by his biographer Eusebius of Caesarea. I told you Eusebius had like the man crush on uh, Constantine. I mean, he sounded like a crazy homo when he talked about Constantine. He just did. I mean, he gushed over Constantine. He just absolutely gushed over him like he was the greatest thing in the world. And he wasn't. He romanticized Constantine so much. For it is and remains a fact that Christianity grows alien to its essence when it is made into law for those who have been merely born instead of reborn. You know what? That's a really good quote. I'm going to read that to you again. Okay, listen up very closely. For it is and remains a fact that Christianity grows alien to its essence when it is made into law for those who have been merely born instead of reborn. Yet that is what Constantinian change affected. That's what happened. Constantine politicized a form of Christianity. It speaks volumes, it would seem, that the monogram which Constantine is said to have invented and which was found its way into almost every Christian church, the monogram that looks like the letter P with an X worked into its stem, the X representing the first letter of the Greek word Christos and the P being the second letter of it was introduced on the shields of Constantine's soldiers, the converted emperor. Wow. Seems not to have had an interest in making it available as a badge for men not in uniform. It was an army. Do you get it? Do you get the fact that ever since the, Don, the, that the Donatists were the faithful of those that came out and said, no, we're not, we're not going along with this. Well, come on. We're preaching Jesus. We're preaching the same gospel. And they were. But what were they doing? They turned it, they politicized it, and they turned it into an army of this world. You see, doctrinally speaking, much of their doctrine on salvatory doctrine was correct. But brethren, we're not only to look at the doctrine of salvation, we're to look at the other doctrines as well. 
That's right. So to take up arms and to say you're doing this in the name of Christ? And, to, and, and, and since when did Christ spread the gospel through the physical sword and his apostles? By the way, I'm reminded of some verses. I might just change your verses. Let me see. I do that stuff sometimes. You get them all written down and, man, you're, you're, you're trying to memorize them. And then I go ahead and change them. But I just remembered something that I really like that I think we should, we should do. Here it is. Acts chapter 1, turn there, please. Acts chapter 1. Verse 6, actually 6 through 8, these are good. I think we'll change. We'll do these. 6 through 8. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? By the way, where's the kingdom to be? Israel. When it comes down from heaven. Amen. In what? The new Jerusalem. Amen? I still believe that. I, I still believe the Bible. I still believe that's the kingdom that's coming. It's Jesus is going to come. And it's the new Jerusalem. Right? And he said unto them, it is not. Now, I want you to pay attention to this because this goes along. Look what Jesus says to them. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in in his own power. None of your business, son. You go about your business that I gave you to do. But ye shall receive power. He goes, oh, it's not for you to know the, the times and seasons that the Father has put in this power into place. That's not for you to know about my kingdom that I set up when I come back. Amen. You bunch of usurpers out there that believe you're setting up God's kingdom here in that way. A worldly earth. No, you're setting up a kingdom of Antichrist. That's what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. Why? How do I know that? Because of right there, that's how. Jesus didn't change his mind. He said this before he left, and he meant it. Now listen to this. But, here's his contrast. They're talking about what? What are the apostles talking about? To be used at wit, to be to be had by what? By the sword, physical force, to rule the world, right? The kingdom of Israel. What did Israel do? They ruled the world at that time. David was king, right? The most of the world at that time. Right. That's why, Je don't you understand, that's why Jesus could so comfortably sit before Pilate and be like, my kingdom's out of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight. And when he looked at me, he said, think it's now that I cannot call down to legions of angels right now come, to come down right now and just, just wipe the floor with all of you, just destroy you and laugh at you. You couldn't do anything if it wasn't for my Father in heaven that allows you to do this. No man taketh my life. I give it freely. I have power to take it. I have power to give it, and I have power to take it again. Amen. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's what he said. Amen. So you have to understand, Jesus was the meek and lowly one. He stood there in front of all those people. Man, I'm telling you, that takes a lot of, that takes a lot of love, man. He did it for you and I. And that takes a lot of grace in believing his father in heaven because he could have wiped the floor with any of them right there. And he just sat there and he's like, so Peter's like, so Peter, you know, the apostles come to him and they're, they're like, when they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the father hath put in his own power. In other words, that's none of your business. But here's what your business is. Here's the great contrast. You see the word? That word, B-U-T, the great contrast. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye power to what? Yeah. 
to, to conquer, to in his name conquer and take kingdoms and murder people and in the name of Christ and, and behead people and kill them for being wrong on their theology? No. He said, but you shall receive power that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What is it for? To be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, part of the earth. Those are your verses right there. Six through eight right there. And why is that? Because they're so fitting. Because Jesus is telling you the nature of his kingdom right there. Spiritual. One day, the physical one will come. Yeah, exactly. There it is. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Yeah. I just, I don't know what to do, right? It's right there. There's the revealed will of God for every believer. Hope you're in a church. Amen. Let's see. In the Constantinian change of a tendency that had been developing for some time was unleashed. A radical change of roles occurred. The Christian religion would now enjoy the benefits, if benefits they be, which the ethnic faith had enjoyed hitherto. And the hardships which had in earlier times fallen upon the Christians would now become the lot of those who lingered at the ancient shrines. And for the same reason that they posed a threat to the sacral order, by the end of the 4th century, the simplest votive offerings set before the erstwhile object, even in the household shrines, made the bringers thereof subject to grievy grievous penalties. So now the Christian government, so to speak, Constantinian Christianity, becomes the per persecutors of those worshiping idols. So why do you think Augustine and those men with their sacral society, their city of God, why do you think they had a problem then? And they said, well, you Donatists get liberty, and because you get liberty, so do these heathens over here get liberty. Well, because they wanted those heathens either to worship God or to die. They wanted to kill them. Right? Gatherings in the signature of the now outlawed faith were strictly prescribed. Indoctrination of the tenets of the ancient faith was strictly forbidden. Not yet baptized persons were required to attend catechism classes in preparation for baptism. All who, after attending such classes, refused to present themselves for baptism or having received it then, relapsed into the old ways, were subject to the ultimate sentence. I just don't see that in my New Testament, do you? It was at this point that Donatism appeared. Somebody, being Donatus or Donatus, decided that enough was enough. That we're not going to follow that. We never were a part of that. And we're not going to turn the persecutors of these heathen and other people. And you're not going to force us to believe what you do or follow what you do. Donatism was essentially a protest against the new sacralism. It was basically a rebellion against the Constantinian change. The tensions that had developed between the Donatists in North Africa and the Catholics were, as Professor Friend had put it, not those of doctrine and philosophy. It was the question of the nature of the church as a society and its relationship to the world, rather than any distinctive beliefs that formed the heart of the controversy between the Catholics and the Donatists. It was their view of government. It was their view of church government as well as secular government and their view of, 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 a, of the church versus a sacral society. And they weren't willing to budge on that. You see, when you look at the Bible, you can't anywhere find Jesus telling his disciples to spread the faith by a sword or force people to be baptized it said to teach them and to baptize them. It didn't say to force them or impale them if they don't. Right. The Donatist pastors were wont to tell their flocks that nothing had changed. Essentially, now that the empire had embraced Christianity, the only difference they said was that whereas in previous times the devil had used force, he was now working in with allies on the inside. See, so the Donatists, the, the Donatists, they were telling their, they, they were telling their, the, their pastors were informing them. Now listen, Satan just trained, changed his tricks. Now it's flattery. And now they're working with the government. 
And the only freedom you have is the freedom that the CDC and Fauci give you. If you got a cold, you don't have any freedom. You put your mask on. Or if you think you might get a cold or you think you're sick, then you got to put this, right? That's, isn't that what it is? Exactly. Very plain and simple. Very simple. By the way, that was a defense against the sacral society. It was. That's right. For the true believer, the result was the same. Namely, persecution for the true followers of Christ. The Donatist Bishop Petillion refused to entertain any difference between the persecutions once staged by a pagan government and the persecutions which his flock was now experiencing at the hands of the now supposedly Christian regime. The number of believers had not changed. Only the tares had become more numerous. The Donatist pastor said that the acre of the Lord continues in Africa alone. They looked upon the clerics who were promoting the change as evil priests working hand in glove with the kings of the earth, men who by their conduct show that they have no king but Caesar. Whew. Oh, man, that is some pretty... Woo. The Donatists continue to think of, of the Church of Christ as a small body of the saved surrounded by the unregenerate mass. Isn't that who we are? They insisted that the independence of the church in regard to the emperor and his officials had to be upheld at all cost. When troops were sent to quell the Donatist rebellion, the followers of Donatus were not the least bit surprised. The new regime was only acting in character. Like that's, oh, we're not, we're not shocked. See, it's like so many people, it's like when, when they, when they, uh, invaded IBT uh, when 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 the the Christian George Bush brother Bush did what he did with was who was it what was the name of his uh, thank you was the name of his uh, attorney general right he was supposed to be as a charismatic Christian what did he do he's the one that sent the order in to invade that church and pull those men out it's always those men that do that. This then, this then was the original Donatism, a rebe rebellion against the encroachments of Christian sacralism, or as we shall henceforth style it at times, against Constantinianism. Because that's all they are. All these, these, uh, these reformers, their groups, most of them are Constantinian. That's their... That's their government. This then was Donatism and an, an attempt to conserve the concept of the church based on personal faith and to obstruct the drift towards a church, including all in a given locality. Baptist doctrine. That's all that is. It's Bible doctrine. It's all it is. There were the very same options before which the reformers stood. Small wonder that the same neo-Donatists came to the lips of men. So once the reformers, they call them neo, the reformers called those Anabaptists, others, oh, you're neo Donatists. Why? Well, because all these men like Luther, and others, they set their little kingdoms up, and Knox and all that, they set their kingdoms up. Or Zwingli. And, and because they set their kingdoms up, you know, you're just neo Donatists. That's okay. We think you're, con you're neo Constantinians. Donatism as a movement in the 4th century was successfully suppressed, but the ideas of Donatism lived on. They reoccurred in wave upon wave of dissent against the medieval sacralist order. There's probably a sound historical core of truth in the sentence written by Dodzvetsky regarding the Constantinian change. He said this, A compromise arose. The empire accepted Christianity, and the church accepted Roman law and the Roman state. Meaning the Catholic Church. A small part of the church retired into the desert and there began to continue its former work. It is with this continuing rebellion against the Constantinian change that we are engaged in this study. With Donatism begins a new variety of heresy, a heresy that is theologically correct. Right? You get what he's saying? Well, it's a her oh, you're a bunch of heretics. That's what they call us, right? 
We shall therefore refer to it as heresy in the rest of this book. To the theological correctness of this heresy, the sources bear eloquent testimony. Even the inquisitors witnessed to it. Those heretics, they said, have the appearance of piety, and this because before men they live justly, believing correctly all things concerning God as well as all the articles contained in the creed. It may be pointed out, however, there was one word in the Apostles' Creed at which the heretics balked at, the word Catholic, in the article dealing with the church. Those heretics, we didn't like that word Catholic. This word they could not add and did not utter. This is not surprising. The word Catholic is derived from the Greek kata, meaning according to, and holos, meaning the entirety. The combination means then according to the entirety and fits into the language of Christian sacralism. It is therefore not surprising that the heretics avoided it. For them, the church was not according to the entirety, but consisted of believing elements only. Moreover, the word had a history. The proponents of Christian sacralism had long ago seen the propaganda value with this word could have in their, in their scheme. Theodosius had given orders that all peoples over whom our, our rule extends shall live in that religion which was revealed to St. Peter. We give orders that all are to adopt the name Catholic Christians. The rest we shall let pass for fools, and they will have to bear the reproach of being called heretics. They must come first under the wrath of God and then also under ours. That's right. It is therefore not at all strange that the heretics avoided the word. The rejection of it must have been quite persistent, for it became one of the telltale marks of the heretic. It is highly instructed that the stepchildren of the Reformation, who continued the tradition of the heretic, also recited the Apostles' Creed correctly, save for the word. The clerk of courts who has recorded the fact for us has added in the parentheses. He volunteered further that this was, as is the custom with the schismatic, which is syn synonym for the heretic. The one thing the prevailing church had against the heretics was their refusal to go along with Christian sacralism. This was their sin, their one and only sin, and it was this sin and this sin only that set the wheels of the church's discipline going. The Donatism was never absent from the medieval scene. In the words of Adolf van Harnack, in the 12 centuries that went before the Reformation, it was never lacked for attempts to get away from the state church, priest church, and to reinstitute the apostolic congregational structuralization. So in other words, basically, they were always forming local New Testament churches, rejecting the papacy and rejecting the, the state church priests. They always rejected them. What is but to say that throughout medieval times there, was ne there never was a moment in which Constantinianism stood unchallenged. Well, where do we find that to be true? What Bible verse do we have that the Lord said would, that would be the case? Ephesians. That's right. That's right. Matthew 16, too. And also, Matthew 16 also, and also Ephesians. That he might receive glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end, right? That, that it was never going to stop. There's, so there's always going to be a church that fought against that system, and there always has been. And you can trace them by the trail of blood. By the way, the one thing that I want to do that we're, that we're going to work on, I want a banner like the one that I saw, but I want it distinctively. I want it good, and I want it distinctively. I want it like this long all the way through. I want the trail of blood, and I want it big, and I want it bold, and I want it done right. And I want us to have that. And I want to point to that. And I, 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 I'd like to have it right behind me or right to the side of me. I don't care where it is, but I want it up, and I want us to be able to see it. Or if it's on one of our walls, which maybe the Lord will move us out of here, but um, uh, if we outgrow it. But, uh, you know, the thing, I want that banner, and I want to show that. I want you to see that and understand that, that that trail of blood, that's how you find them. You find them by, their, by the blood that was shed. Amen. Donatism was never absent, though, from, from uh, fighting Constantinianism. Constantinianism never went unchallenged. In the company of the heretics, the New Testament was honored. We, we shall return to this matter also, he says. And wherever the New Testament is held in honor, there it, its concepts of the Church of Christ will continue to challenge. There a church based on personal faith will challenge the concept of a church embracing all. Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Outside of their doors, all are welcome. I can't say that here. Amen. 
I like I can't say that. I I can't I I can't. Can you? All are not welcome here in that sense. No, they can't either. Right, that they would walk in. They would they would walk into the assembly, but it wasn't normal for them to be there. What's normal is, that, you know, here's the concept that if you, if a pastor learns this, and any men that are trained out of here must understand this, we preach to the people that we have. We don't preach to the people that we think we're going to have or that we're going to, and by the way, that doesn't mean that when people come in, God doesn't hit them because the Holy Ghost works that way, amen? So we don't know. But what I'm saying is we preach to the church. This church is for the, ed it's for the edification of the saints, for the work of the ministry. That's why we're not, it's not about trying to draw in crowds of people to do all that. That's not, see, that's where they lost the concept. You see how, how that's, that, that, that system permeates even today in most churches. That because of their corporate Constantinian structure of their corporation, they really have to justify what they do and who they are. They have to justify it by their books. They have to justify it by their paperwork. They have to justify it by all these things and to do those things in order to be that nonprofit where we don't believe that's the case. We believe that God builds his church. That doesn't mean we don't preach the gospel and it means we do that because that's what God's commanded us to do, right? That's the difference. The battle between these two concepts of the church had been raging for 12 centuries when Luther put the trumpet of reform to his lips. The noise of this battle had by no means decreased. Contemporaries who were in position to know have gone on record to the effect that there were then more, more men committed to the views of the heretic than there had ever been. In many areas, the populace was so much on the side of the heretic. By the way, that's you. He's putting that heretic in, in parentheses in this book because he's, it's us. That's who he's talking about. We were always the redheaded stepchild, right, Jacob? Always. That, that the executions had to be carried out at night. Or in many of the areas, the populace was so much on the side of the heretic that the executions had to be carried out at night or early in the morning for fear of a tumult. They were afraid that all those Christians would gather together because they were killing their people innocently. Sometimes the age-old provision that death sentences had to be announced with the toiling of the bell was conveniently ignored. At times, jails in which heretics had been incarcerated were stormed and their prisoners set free. The frantic efforts used by the church to keep in power are in themselves proof enough that revisionism was an ever-present threat. As a recent investigator has put it, the Protestant left was the heir of the medieval underworld. It had categories of thought and a vocabulary emerging from late medieval heresies, vocabulary which preexisted the Reformation and had its own power and momentum quite apart from Luther. But listen to this. There's every reason to believe the Reformers were quite aware of the ancient battle. How could it be otherwise? It may safely be said that a person could not spend the span of human life anywhere in Europe without coming in contact personally with the heretic. There were inquisitors everywhere. Some of these had a record of consigning men to the flames at the rate of almost one a day. How could an informed person remain unaffected by the tradition of the heretics? They knew us, and they knew us well. Moreover, there is every reason to believe the reformers were at the first sympathetic toward much of the old heritage of the heretic. They said things that cheered the hearts of people who had been conditioned by it. Sometimes they said things that were definitely in the idiom of the old protest. For a while, it seemed, at least to onlookers who wanted to see it in that way, that the reformers were going to be the answer to the prayers of the heretics. Right? They thought... They did. They thought that that was going to be a hope. Could you imagine being them, though, how you could see that? Well, they seem to be preaching the gospel. Maybe they're not going to kill us anymore. Maybe they'll actually help us, and we can see this change that's going to come. Um, nope, just bad news for you. When the reformers presently gave evidence as 
give it they did, that they were not intent on sweeping the Constantinian heritage away. There was an arching of the eyebrows among some who were walking with them. When the reformers accepted the proffered arm of the civil rulers, as accepted they did, then there were frowns, frowns, which soon changed into audible groans of disillusionment. And there, and then there was the exodus. And with that, the stepchildren were on the scene and the second front. What caused an exodus was the reformers' drift towards Neo-Constantinianism. As the stepchildren saw things, history was repeating itself. A new Christian sacralism was taking shape on a smaller scale, to be sure, and with some version of a reformed faith in the saddle. It was this new Christian sacralism that precipitated the Neo-Donatists. Small wonder they were called by that name. The parallel between the things that had happened in and with the coming of the Constantinian change and that which was happening now was indeed close. So close to, as to be uncanny, just as his rounds with the original Donatists had made of Augustine, the unrestrained sacralist that he became, so did the reformers in their rounds with the Neo-Donatists become the uninhibited supporters of Neo-Constantinianism that the record shows them to have been. The parallel can be drawn closer still, just as the original Donatism had its lunatic fringe in the so-called Circumcilians, which wasn't really a part of them. So did the latter Donatism have in the lunatic fringe of the men of Munster, which is interesting. I'll be honest with you, I've not studied enough on the men of Munster, but I sure want to, because I was reading a few things, and it appears that there were some Jesuits that would become whatever they needed to become in order to produce what they did. Because no Anabaptist that I've ever seen in history held to a doctrine of the Munster Rebellion and things that took place there. I never saw one doctrinal position like that ever from them. So anyway, it'll be interesting when I get to that point and I study that a little bit more. But uh, anyway, but, but he... But again, just as Augustine's experience with the Donatists led him to make certain retractions in which he con controverted his own earlier affirmations, so did their dealings with the Neo-Donatists cause the Reformers to repudiate some of the things they had stood for earlier. So writing their own retractions, as it were, in its proper place, we shall return to this. Uh, Zwingli did it. Zwingli first was against infant baptism and things like that. Then what happened? He got in power. He got in power, and then he time to burn some people. Just as the erstwhile Donatists had insisted that the independence of the church with respect to the emperor must be upheld, so later, so did the, la the latter Donatists insist that a true church cannot exist where the secular rule and the Christian church are blended together. It runs like a refrain through the testimony of the stepchildren that as they saw it, the Reformation had gone sour when the reformers had made a league with the civil powers. It was therefore been very well said that the crystallization of the Reformation in territorial churches or in parishes led by city political authorities gave the impulse for the development of the Second Front. A good start had been made, so said the stepchildren, but the enlistment of the magistrates had spoiled it all. One of the manifestos that issued from the Second Front says, after relating a great deal of older history of the heretic, in 1519... Martin Luther began to write against the frightful abominations of the Babylonian harlot and to disclose all her wickedness. Yes, as with the thunderclaps to bring it all down. But as soon as he joined himself to the secular rule, seeking protection there against the cross, then it went with him as with a man who in mending an old kettle only makes the hole bigger. And he raised up a people altogether callous in sin. Wow. The charge lodged with many variations was that the reformers had begun well but had spoiled their beginning when they reverted back to the medieval pattern of things. I think we'll stop right there and we'll continue on next week with, with that. I hope you're learning some things from it because I am. you're starting to see the system that was formed from Constantine and the reformers just duplicated Constantine's system. Right. Later they would. But where did it come from? The struggle came through Constantinianism and Donatism. And that's why the Donatists are so hated. But what actually were they? New Testament, Bible-believing, Baptist people. Amen. And that's why they were hated. Because they would not go along with that sacral society. They did not believe 
that it was biblical, they did not believe it was accurate, and they believed that they should have nothing to do with it and that it was a danger. And look, they were right, because look what the monstrosity turned into. A hundred million Christians or more murdered. That's right. Yes, they are. No, they're not. They're Constantinians. And they have a system. And albeit, notice how the simple system of Donatism was hated so much. And were the Donatists saying anything apart that the apostles said? Not a thing. Not a thing. But see, it didn't fit Constantine's system. The emperor, the Roman Empire, that would be largely taken over by the crusade and, and, and be the crusades. And that's what it would be. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the teaching that you've given us, Lord, here today, just the truth that we can understand history, Lord, because we understand your word by your grace and by your Holy Spirit. You've taught it to us, Lord. We can see it. We see these simple people, the Baptist. And dear God, I pray that we'd walk before you in sincerity and truth and be good citizens and be even better Christians in that sense. And where society departs from the book, that we stick with the book and we follow you. And we know one day, Lord, you'll come back and you'll rule and reign. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.